you can turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 4. Whether you have your Bibles, your electronic device, it will also be on the screen this morning. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. It says this, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitudes, they, they, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind. And said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm that came over the water. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? There was another storm that took place when when Peter was walking on the water one day. and, And Jesus looked at Peter in that storm and he says, you of little faith. But in this situation, he looks at them and he says, not, not only do you not only have little faith, he says, you have absolutely no faith. And he goes on and says, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him. Let us pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, that God, that you inhabit the worship and the the praise of your people, God. So God, you are here with us today. Your Holy Spirit is alive and active, Lord. God, I thank you for the individuals that got baptized today, God, that took that step of faith, Lord. And may it be an encouragement for our hearts and our spirits today. Now, God, I'm asking that you make the word of God come to life for us, Lord. God, give us ears to hear. Give us a heart to receive, Lord. And God, I'm asking that you would increase our faith today, God. So God, where fear abounds, may our faith abound much more greater in our lives, Lord. And God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise today. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, are you still afraid? Look at your neighbor and say, are you still afraid? Look at your other neighbor and say, are you still afraid? We are in the final week of our series entitled Faith Over Fear. And what we've been doing hopefully in this series and what's hopefully happening in your life is this, is the the concept is we want to expose fear and we want to build faith. We want to expose the fear that the enemy tries to bring against us and we want to build the faith that God has for us. And so in week one, we said, you know, the enemy's plan is to bring fear into your life, that he has a strategy to use fear to get you off course from where God wants you to be. And we too, we talked about how sometimes fear marks the spot. That just because fear is present doesn't mean that that's not what God has for you. So the children of Israel were fearful to go into the land, but guess what? That's the exact place that God wanted them. And so sometimes the enemy uses fear to keep us from the promises, to keep us from the purpose that God has over our life. Last week, we talked about being driven by fear. That if we're not careful, we will pick up fears throughout our life and then those fears will begin to drive the decisions and the choices that we make in our life. And today, as we wrap up this series, I want to talk to you about, I feel like I'm drowning. Like, Like I feel like I am drowning. Has anyone in this room ever been in a storm in their life? Maybe not a physical storm, but have you ever gone through something that it just seems like all of life is crashing in on you? Have you ever been in a situation where it seems like wave after wave after wave after wave has come against you or your family? Like, I don't know about you, but I love beach vacations. And one of the things that I love about the ocean is that when there's actually some good waves, I love getting into the waves and jumping in the waves. But there's been some times where I've been in the waves and I'm jumping and the wave hits me from one side and takes me under and hits me from the other side and takes me under and it's in those moments that you feel like you are drowning and for some of us in this room today that's how life feels it feels like everything that's happening in life is crashing down against you and it's hitting you so hard that you feel like you are drowning well that's the situation the disciples found themselves in You have to understand the context of what has taken place before this event, before they found themselves in the middle of the storm. That they have just come out of one of the greatest situations in their life. That Jesus had gone up to a mountain and he had spent time praying. And after he had prayed, he handpicked 12 disciples to be his followers, to, to follow after him. 
This event that we read is shortly after the inauguration of the disciples. And you have to understand that there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were following Jesus at this time. Hundreds of people that were trying to get close to him. And out of those hundreds of people, he picks these 12 men to be his disciples. These would be the ones to preach the gospel, to expand the kingdom of God. You have to imagine how these guys felt. I mean, they had to be feeling special. They probably felt like they were very unique, that they were gifted, that they were anointed. And after he actually finishes picking the 12, he continues to preach to the multitudes. And the Bible says that, that so many people are crowding around that Jesus goes into this home and, and the home is packed, it's overflowing, and that Jesus' mother and brothers come and, and they're worried about Jesus, that he's not taking care of himself, that he's not eating. And, and they send a message to the disciples to say to Jesus that, that his mother and his brothers are there to see him. And then Jesus looks at the crowd that he's teaching to and he says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? And then he looks at those that are sitting around him, looks at his disciples and says, those who do the will of my father is my mother and my brother. And in that moment, the disciples have to be thinking to themselves, whoa, like Jesus has just declared us a part of his family. Like these guys are in. Jesus continues to preach and the crowds continue to grow and people are gathering all around him. And it's after all of these events have taken place. It's after this moment that the disciples have this great calling of God upon their life that they find themselves in the middle of a storm. You see, some storms come out of nowhere and some storms happen gradually in our life. And, and sometimes you can see the storm coming and sometimes it just knocks you off course. It didn't know, you didn't know where it hits you from. So here Jesus is. He's teaching to the crowds and he looks at his disciples and he says, let's get into the boat and let's go to the other side. Jesus is fatigued from his preaching and from ministering and Jesus goes into the stern of the boat and, and he puts his head on a pillow and the Bible says that he falls asleep. And while Jesus is asleep in the stern of the boat, the waves begin to increase. The winds begin to race. And all of a sudden, the disciples find themselves in the middle of a storm. Here they are on the Sea of Galilee. And what you have to understand about this specific body of water is that it was surrounded by mountains. And it was known that in, when you were on the sea, that if you weren't careful, that a storm could come in and the winds would come down the mountains and that, that it would swirl around the, that sea. It would swarm around this body of water, causing fierce waves to take place. And this is where the disciples are. The, the waves have increased and the boat has begun to take on water and it's beginning to sink. Now you understand that these individuals, these disciples, they, they weren't always disciples. Before they followed after Jesus, before they were the 12 that were chosen by Jesus, they were fishermen. So this wasn't their first rodeo. This wasn't the first time they had ever been in a storm. This isn't the first time that they had ever been in a boat. And so you have to understand that this must have been some type of fierce storm to put fear into the hearts of men that were used to being on boats, that were used to being in the middle of the storm. And it's this fear that all of a sudden overtakes these guys. It's the fear in their heart that is so great that all of a sudden they forget that Jesus was in the boat. And if we're not careful in seasons of our life where the storms begin to rage, we will forget that Jesus is in the boat. Now here's the problem with a series like this entitled Faith Over Fear. The problem with a series like this is that if we're not careful... As we journey through a series and we, we talk about having faith over our fear, it can make you, if you're not careful, feel like you are less spiritual if you experience fear in your life. If you're not careful, you'll take from this series that, that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And, and then you'll begin to think, if I, if I, don't, if I have fear in my life, then, then I must not be experiencing the, the, the relationship that I need with God. And, and I must not have the spirit of God in my life. And, and the point of this series isn't to tell you that, that you shouldn't experience fear. But it's honestly to prepare you for the fact that fear is going to come against you. That fear is part of the broken world in which we live in. 
that we will all find ourselves in situations and circumstances of life that you will feel overcome, you will feel overwhelmed, and you will feel fearful. And when that happens, what I want to do is I want to prepare you for that moment so that you understand what is the proper way to respond when fear begins to set itself up against me. That when you feel yourself being overwhelmed with fear, that when all of a sudden you walk into work and they start talking about layoffs on the job, what should be my response? That that when all of a sudden there's a health crisis in your family and fear begins to set itself up against your heart and your spirit, what should be your response? That when all of a sudden your family is struggling and going through a rough season and you feel fearful, what should be our response as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. What should you do when fear begins to set itself against you? And so if you're taking notes this morning, I want to give you three things, three thoughts of things that you should do when fear begins to come against you. The first is this, that when you feel overwhelmed with fear, you need to really trust what he said. You need to really trust what he said. Now, Hopefully you caught it. I didn't just say trust what he said. That you need to really trust what he said. Because the truth is, is for many of us that have gathered here today, we would all say, I believe in God. I believe in the word of God. I believe in the promises of God. But what we really believe isn't revealed in peaceful times in our life. What you really believe is going to be revealed in the moments of life where the storm comes rolling in. It's in that season of life that will show you what your true beliefs are. In this story we read, the disciples should have really believed. They should have really believed Jesus when he said, let's cross over to the other side. Let's get in this boat and let's cross over to the other side. Because Jesus didn't say, hey guys, let's get in this boat. And let's get halfway out in the middle and let's just die in the middle of this lake. He didn't say, hey guys, let's get in this boat and I hope we make it to the other side. Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, let's get in this boat and let's cross over to the other side. And so if Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side, guess where Jesus was planning on going that day? the other side, that that is what he said and what he promised is was going to happen in their life. The only problem was that when the storm came up and the disciples, they were in the middle of that storm, they became so struck with fear that it wiped out their memory and they thought to themselves, we are gonna die here in this boat. Can I tell you what often happens in your life? You go through a situation, you go through a circumstance in life, the storm begins to rage and you you begin to forget what it is that God has spoken over your life. The storm starts to rage and they say, hey, there's cancer. And all of a sudden you think to yourself, "Uh uh-oh, God must not have seen this cancer coming in my life. He must not have seen the contention, the the arguments, the fighting that was going to come in this relationship. He must not have seen that the divorce was actually coming. But can I remind you that in the middle of the storm, we have to trust what he's really said over our life because the character and the nature of God is this, that if he's spoken it over your life, it is going to happen. It will take place. Here's how he says it in Numbers 23. He says, God is not a man, this is the character of God, that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? that we have to be reminded that when Jesus speaks, you can take it to the bank. That if he said something, he will do it. And so in the midst of the storms that come, when fear begins to try to grip our hearts, it's important that you know what he said. It's important that you know what he's spoken over you. And the problem that we have and the reason that fear grips our heart and the fear overwhelms us is for many of us, We don't know what he's actually said. We don't know what he's actually promised. And because we don't know what he said about our situation and our circumstance, we respond based on what we see and how we feel instead of by what he said. 
This is often how you respond in life. You go through a difficult season. And you're like, Aaron, I'm responding based on what I see and what I feel. And in my heart, I feel fear over this situation. And with my eyes, it seems like the outcome is going to be negative. And that is often how we respond. But that is not how God has called us to respond. Because we have to really trust what he has said about our life. If you are a boating type person, you understand that in a boat, there's always going to be a thing called a life preserver. Sometimes there are these round objects that if the boat goes down or someone goes overboard, you can throw them a life preserver. And when they hold on to that, it's going to sustain them so that they don't drown. As believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that God has given us a life preserver. And the life preserver that he's given to us is the word of God for each and every one of us. And if you don't have the word of God in your heart, you will not have an anchor to put down in the storm. You will not have an anchor to put down in the storm. If the word of God is not seated deeply in your heart and in your spirit, you will not have an anchor to sustain you when fear begins to grip your heart. And because that's the anchor for our life, that's why it's so important that I'm reading the word of God for myself. That I'm consuming and digesting the word of God. That's why the Bible says you need to hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him. Now, too often when we read this passage of scripture, we get caught up on that word sin. And we're like, hey, I, I got to read the word of God because if I don't read the word of God, I'm going to be a wretched person. I'm not going to be a good person. But that's not exactly what he means in that moment. That to sin means to miss the mark or to, to get off course. That sin in our life can be that we got off course of God's plan in our life. That, that he had a purpose for us and, and I'm missing the mark. I, I'm missing the course that God has set up for me in my life. And so we need to understand that it is God's word that keeps me on track. It's God's word that propels me to the destiny that he has for my life. And therefore, I need to read God's word because I need to know what it is that he's saying to me. I need to keep my life on track. But not only do I need to read God's word, I need to hear God's word. And when you gather and hear on a Sunday morning, that's what you're doing. Whether you realize it or not, that when you sit here and you hear the word of God, God is putting his word in your heart so that it can become an anchor in the storm. And, and what you have to understand, the reason I encourage you to journal, the reason I encourage you to write things down is because you may walk in here on one Sunday and you may not even be going through a storm right now. And in your mind, you may think, Aaron, this doesn't apply to me. But guess what? When the word of God gets into your spirit, it gets into your heart and you know the word of God, you may not go through a storm today or next week or next month, but guess what? At some point you will, and you'll have the word of God in your heart to be reminded that guess what? I don't have to be fearful in this situation. I know what he said, and I can stand upon that word. So not only do I need to read the word of God for myself, but I need to, I need to hear God's word so that it becomes an anchor for my soul. But not only do I need to read and hear God's word, I also need to learn how to speak God's word. I need to learn how to speak it. What I see in this story is this, is that nobody on that boat that day in the middle of the storm said, hey guys, wait. Hold on. Jesus said, let's get in the boat and cross over to the other side. You see, if they had realized what Jesus had spoken over their life, they would have understood in that moment that, guess what? Our lives can't end in this boat because Jesus has already told me where we're heading on this journey. And we have to understand that it's in those moments of life where the storm begins to rage that we have to begin to declare the words of God over the situation and the circumstances that we're going through. Isaiah 59 verse 19 says it this way. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, and the enemy will come in like a flood, he'll just pour into your life. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. 
that the Spirit of God, His Holy Spirit, will lift up a standard against the enemy. What is the standard that He lifts up? It's this right here. It's the Word of God. This is the standard that He lifts up in those seasons. And if I don't have any of this in me, guess what? Then I don't have a standard to lift up when the enemy begins to speak something negative over my life. That when the doctor walks into that room and says, hey, it looks like cancer and you need to get your affairs in order. You only have three months to live. If I don't have this word in me, guess what? I might believe the word of the doctor. But when I have the standard that's inside my heart and spirit, I can begin to say, but the blood of Jesus speaks a better word over my life that by his stripes I am healed. So I know that's the report you've given me, but that's not the standard that I'm lifting up in this situation. There is another word that is greater than any word that the doctor could give in your situation. Would you give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise? So this becomes the standard for my life because guess what? He's going to set up a standard against the enemy. So when you begin to feel your life being gripped with fear, when you begin to feel yourself being overwhelmed with the circumstances that are going on around you, you have to trust what he really said. Really trust what he said. And if he said it and spoken it, know that he is not a God who lies, that you can take it to the bank. The second thing you need to do when you feel yourself being overwhelmed with fear is this, is we need to always locate Jesus in the storm. Always locate Jesus in the storm. What I see in the story is this, is they didn't start looking for Jesus until they realized they couldn't bail out enough water on their own strength. That they didn't start looking for Jesus until they realized, you know what, we have no other way to get out of this storm. And what we have to begin to understand as believers and followers of Jesus Christ is that prayer needs to happen early and often. It has to happen early and often. Now, I'm not going to throw you guys under the bus because I do that too often. So I'm going to throw myself under the bus. And I want you to understand that this is not my natural tendency. My natural tendency isn't always just to go to Jesus when something is going wrong, even though it should be. Because the natural tendency I have in life is that of a fixer. Like when I see a problem, you know what I think? How do I fix the problem? How do I solve the problem? This is an issue. How, what are we going to do to take care of this issue that's going on? My wife has called this out in me several times. Like when we first got married, I had to learn this the hard way because she would bring a problem to me and I'd be like, Haha, I got this for you. I got a solution. And then she would look at me and she'd be like, I don't need a solution. And I'm like, what do you need? She's like, I just need you to listen. And I'm like, but I got a solution because I'm a fixer. And so often this is our natural tendency with God is that when life storms come our way, guess what? We just think we can fix it. We go into fix it mode and that's where the disciples are. They're like, you know what? There's a big storm. Water is coming into the boat. So water in, we're just gonna bail out water. That's what we should be doing. And yet the response should have been water in, Where's Jesus? Water in. Jesus, where are you at in this situation? Can we get practical for a moment? What is your natural tendency? What is the natural tendency when you show up for work work one day and there's all of a sudden there's rumors that layoffs are going to take place? Do we pray first? Or do we go to that person who's higher up than us and, and try to figure out if we are going to lose our job? What do you do when financial trouble hits your home? Do you try to figure out how you're going to make it all work? Do you say, hey, I'm going to go get a second job and I'm going to put this on this credit card and and I'm going to try to make this bill and make these things work together? Do you do that or do you go to Jesus first? Because in the middle of the storm, we need to locate Jesus. When you have issues that are going on with your children and they're not behaving the way that you think they should behave, do you go to your friend for advice or do you look and turn your eyes to Jesus and say, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? When things are not going well in life, what do you do? What is your natural response? Is our response to go to Jesus? And so often when the storms of life begin to rage, our natural tendency is to try to fix it. But what we have to understand is that our natural nature is not godly. 
Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that, guess what? We are made of flesh and our tendencies are not godly tendencies. So the Bible says, don't be led by your flesh, but be led by the spirit of God. So I can't be led by what I feel like I wanna do in this moment. I need to give way to the Holy Spirit working in my life and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I don't know what's best in this situation. And I'm not gonna sit back and just try to fix it on my own. In the middle of the storm, I'm gonna locate Jesus and I'm gonna say, okay, God, what is it that you need me to do in the middle of this situation? And when fear begins to grip your heart, when fear begins to set itself up against you, You know what you got to do? You got to locate Jesus in the middle of the storm. The disciples lost Jesus in the boat. Now, this wasn't the first time that Jesus was lost. People were losing Jesus all the time. Like the first people to lose Jesus was Mary and Joseph, the mother and the father of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if anybody here has ever lost their children. Like if you did, we won't make you admit to it today, okay? I don't know if you've ever lost your children, but that's bad enough. But can you imagine being entrusted with someone else's child and then losing them? Like this is what happens for Mary and Joseph. Like they are entrusted by God in heaven. And he comes to him and says, hey, Mary and Joseph, can you watch after Jesus? Like from the time he's born till he's 33, can, can you watch after him? And so they're supposed to watch him for 33 years and 12 years in, they lose him. The Bible says they went to Jerusalem, to the temple, to to worship God. And all of a sudden, they've they've been there. It's a family event. It's a family affair. People are coming from everywhere to worship at the temple. Mary and Joseph pack up their stuff. They're all packed up, and they're about ready. They're getting on the road. And then all of a sudden, guess what? They realize they've left Jesus somewhere. Can you imagine that conversation between Joseph and Mary that day? Mary shouts up to Joseph, hey, is Jesus with you? Joseph shouts back, why would he be with me? Mary looks at him and goes, you're supposed to have him. And Joseph's probably going, you're supposed to have him. And they're arguing back and forth because they've left Jesus. They've lost the son of God. Now that's bad. And here's the story in Luke 2, verse 48 through 49. It says, so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? When the disciples lost Jesus in the boat, they said, do you care that we are perishing? When Mary lost Jesus, she looks at him and says, why have you treated us like this? Can I tell you what happens is we lose Jesus in our storms because we make life all about us. Look at the response. Do you care that we're perishing? Why have you done this to us? And when we become so self-centered in life and you make life all about you, guess what? You are going to lose Jesus in the middle of the storms that are happening around you. Jesus responded to his mother and said this. He says, look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I must be about my father's business. See, the Bible says that Jesus was the lamb to be slain from the very beginning of time. The reason that he came into the world was to be born a virgin, to live a sinless life, and to prove that he was the Messiah. But guess what? The Bible never said anywhere that he was to prove that he's to be the Messiah and then to drown in a boating accident. Time and time again, he told his disciples, I have come into this world to be a sinless sacrifice, to die on a cross so that the curse of sin will be broken off of all people's life. So if Jesus was in that boat, that boat was not going down because he had a purpose on earth and his purpose was to fulfill his father's business. At the age of 12, he knew that he had his father's business to fulfill. At the age of 33, he knew that he was to be about his father's business. Can I tell you something that will help you in the middle of the storms if you know what it is that God has called you to do? 
If you know what it is, the reason that God has placed you on this earth, if you have purpose to your life, if you are about the business of the kingdom of God, guess what? In the middle of the storm, you're going to have some assurance because when you know what God has called you to do, you're going to realize that, guess what? This is a storm that's going to come and go because God has already called me to something greater this, and therefore I cannot die in the middle of this storm because I have a purpose on my life. One of the most dangerous ways to live your life is to live a selfish life. And the reason it's so dangerous to live a selfish life is this, is that if you live a selfish life, if your life is not about the kingdom of God, then guess what? If your life is all about you, then if your life comes to an end, the only thing that is lost is your life. But when you leverage your life for the kingdom of God, when you leverage your life to fulfill the purposes and, and you begin to get about the Father's business in your life, then guess what? The kingdom of God, is gonna, he's going to sustain you. He's going to keep you. He's going to continue to guard you because guess what? Your life is having kingdom impact and he needs you here on earth. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, he says this, Do you not know? that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you, that my body, my life is the temple of God and the spirit of God is on the inside of me. And so guess what? If his spirit is inside of me, then I must be about the business of my father. And when we get distracted and we get off course in life and we don't get about the business of the kingdom of God, it's in those moments that fear will grip your heart. But guess what? When I'm about my father's business and I'm about the business of the kingdom of God, it's in those moments I can say, guess what? I can't go down in this storm because I still have a work to do for my God. And so it's important to understand what, what's the prayers of your life look like? Like are your prayers, if God answers your prayer, does it change your world or the world? If it only changes your world, guess what? Why does God need to answer that prayer? But if it changes the world, he has every reason to show up in your circumstances. If you're praying for that job and God gives you that job, how does that job affect the kingdom of God? If it's just for your kingdom, why should God answer that prayer? Because it stops at you. If God gives you that spouse that you've been praying for, does it affect the kingdom of God or does it just affect your world? Because we've got to be about the business of the Father. And when our prayers begins to change the world, then God can move in your life, not just for you, but for the lives that will be impacted by you for the kingdom of God. And so when fear begins to grip your heart, always locate Jesus in the storm. The third and final thing is this this morning. Never lose sight of his love. Never lose sight of his love. Mark 4 verse 38 he says, but, but he was in the storm asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we're drowning in this moment? See, I find it amazing how we go through certain seasons of life, and our reaction is, God has forgotten me. It's amazing how we go through storms, and that's our first thought that comes across our mind. God, where are you? Do you care? Have you forgotten about me? Like the disciples didn't come to Jesus and say, hey, God, can you do something about this difficult situation we're going through? Notice that they didn't ask him to fix the problem that they were experiencing in life. What they do is they immediately made an indictment against his character. They said, God, you don't care. Like you just must not care about our life. And I love Jesus' response. I love how calm he is. He just gets up from his nap. He goes out and he looks at the storm and he said, peace, be still. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, what's wrong with your faith? Why do you have no faith? Never lose sight of his love. Because we have to understand it is impossible. It is impossible for Jesus not to care that Jesus always cares. And when we find ourselves in the middle of the storm, we need to understand that God has always been right by our side. 
That the storm does not take God off, off. He's not like blinded by it. It's not like, oh my word, where did this storm come from? He knew this storm would come. But he also knows that where he's taking you is to the other side of the storm. And that on the other side of the storm, you're going to need a bigger faith. And Jesus would look at us in the middle of our storms and say, you know what? I love you and I care for you enough to allow you to go through a situation, not on your own, but I allow you to go through a situation with me by your side. Because I know that once we get through the storm, it will increase your trust in me in a way that if life was easy, it would never increase your your faith. Because what builds our faith in life, what makes our faith greater in life is that when we're in the midst of the storm, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords rises up and says, peace be still. And it's in that moment that our faith is increased and our faith becomes greater. And so we never lose sight of his love. Romans 8 37 verse 39 says this, yet in all things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. You aren't just surviving. You have more than you need. You are more than a conqueror this morning. But you're like, Aaron, 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 I I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like life has just swamped me, that's covered me, that that I'm getting beat up by all the waves that life is throwing my way. No, no, no. You are more than a conqueror. You have not just survived, and you have more than you need. And you need to understand, though you feel like that, feelings lie. Because you are not at the end, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And so we're more than conquerors. He said, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. That nothing, he goes on in verse 39, he keeps going. That nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. That you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when fear comes in and the storm begins to rage, never lose sight of his love. That he cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. He's never left you, nor has he forsaken you. Don't question in the middle of the storm. Does does my God care? Don't ever question that. You can question, God, what are you doing? You can ask him, what lesson are you trying to teach me? Because once you learn that lesson, you'll probably get out of the storm quicker. But in the middle of the storm, don't ever question whether God cares. Because it's impossible for God not to care. So never lose sight of his love no matter what you're going through. So let me end here. Oftentimes, when we open up the word of God and and we read scripture, most of the stories we read oftentimes illustrate how not to respond, right? Like like in this story, if you're going through a storm, what don't we do? Don't question God's love for you. Don't start bailing, start praying. Don't trust in yourself, trust in him. And so we often pick up the word of God and there's stories about how we shouldn't respond in situations and circumstances. So as I read this story, I I, I begin to wonder, like, what would have been the proper response of the disciples? What, What should have been the response? I mean, the reality is, is the boat was filling with water and they were in the storm. So what should they have done? What did God want them to do in that moment that would have pleased him? What would have changed the circumstances where he would have looked at him and said, man, you are people of great faith. I mean, option A is that they could have stumbled over to Jesus in the stern of the boat and and they could have come to him and said something like, Lord and Savior, great and mighty God, I know that you are asleep, but could you awaketh from your sleep? And could you speak to the storm and, and tell it to be still? If they had done that, it would have seemed a lot like prayer that we're talking to God and we're taking the situation to Jesus. But I think there's another option that God would have loved to have seen out of their response that would have built faith and would have shown their confidence and their faith in who Jesus was and what he had in store for them. I think there's another option that he wants us to take in our life 
when we find ourselves in the middle of the storm and it's found in 1 John 4, verse 17. He says, love has been perfected. The word perfected can also be replaced with the word maturity, that, that your, his love has become mature in us. It's been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness. There's a boldness that God wants to come over your life. So you may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. That a boldness, as, the, as his love is perfected, as it's matured in us, there should be a boldness that comes upon us that we begin to understand. As he is, so are we in this world. So you have to ask, if we're to live our lives as he is, so are we in this world. What did he do in that moment? What did Jesus do? Because what he did is what we should do. And what we see in the life of Jesus, that when the disciples come to him and the storm is raging all around him, he gets up and he speaks to the storm and he declares over that storm, peace be still. And so when we find ourselves in the storms of life, here's what I believe that God wants us to do. When fear begins to grip our heart, we need to start declaring over our lives that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. As he is, so can I do. And therefore, I have the ability in the midst of the chaos around me, in the middle of situations that are overwhelming with fear, in those moments, I have the ability to start talking to my storms. I have the ability to start declaring over the storms that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this storm that I'm going through. I have the ability to speak over those situations. So when there's contention in my home and there's arguing and fighting all the time, I can speak to that storm and I can begin to declare, peace be still over this storm. When all of a sudden there's sickness in the life of my children, I can declare that they will be healed in the name of Jesus. Whatever the storm looks like, if there's a lack in your life, speak to the lack. If there's depression in your life, speak over that depression. If there's issues of anger in your life, you speak over that. And I begin to declare the power of Jesus Christ over every storm in my life. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And all authority in heaven has been given to me in the name of Jesus Christ. Give him an ovation of praise. And so if Jesus is going to speak to the storms, I can speak to the storms. And I can declare the standard that he has set up in his word. And I can declare it over every situation that I'm going through. Because what we need to understand is that every storm, every storm you go through, every moment of your life that is gripped with fear, that every storm will turn into an accelerator of your faith. And your faith will become greater than any bit of fear that you face in this world that God will bring you to a place after the storm that will make you speak and make you believe and make you walk in a boldness like you have never had before in your life, that after that storm, you're gonna begin to realize that all authority in heaven has been given to me by the name of Jesus Christ, and I can speak over these situations. I can speak over these fears. I can speak over my children. I can speak over my marriage. I can speak over my family because God has spoken over my life, and there's a standard that he's raising in this day and in this age. Would you give Jesus Christ one more ovation of praise? So if you would, go ahead and stand to your feet with me this morning.